It's Monday, the 23rd of May, 2016. I am Robin Yellow, and this is TechTasm, episode 16, Google I.O. Redux. And with me again, because nobody else is free, is Dr. James Woodall. I feel privileged. It's nice to know that, you know, if nobody else, I mean, wow, and we do need to record, you may as well just give me a call, yeah? Do you know, it's always you. Every week, I hope it's going to be somebody else, and it's always you. I can change my voice or name if that would help. Uh, possibly, okay. possibly. But this week, James and I are going to be looking at Google, Google, <clears throat> Google, Google I.O., Xiaomi, and Nokia is back from the grave. And we'll be judging these stories and others to determine if they are tectasms, which by our definition is a blend of tech for technology and tantasm for phantasm, something that exists only in a person's mind. So without further intro, let's get on with the first story. Well, James, you know what the first story is. It's a review of last week's Google I.O., all the news from Google's huge event. Did you watch uh, the live stream, James? Oh, um, uh, no. (laughs) Well, that's okay, because I watched it all. And, of course, Android N was announced, but not the name. So it it wasn't Namey McNameface. Were you you upset, uh, James? Uh, Yeah, mortally wounded, yes. No, that's good. Come on, I mean, you know, they've got to be serious, you know, with names like Kit Kat and Marshmallow. Nutella. Um, Well, one of the first reveals was Google Assistant. Now, this is the kind of name they've given to what used to be called, what used to be Google Now, what still is Google Now, uh, the Siri equivalent on Android. Uh, And they described this as a new personal AI for users, which uh, allows it to uh, not uh, not only answer queries, but also butt in to your conversation if required. Uh, because one of the first major announcements was Google Home, which is a little looks like a little Glade air freshener with a sort of animated uh, light screen on the top that allows you to talk to it very much like Amazon's Echo. Mm, yes. It's really interesting, that, isn't it? Um, I, Did I you think, buy one? Uh, um, I, I think I won't. Because I'm not in the Google ecosystem like you are, but it's certainly. But you do do Google searches, don't you? Uh, yeah, I do, but I. I think that's probably it. <laughs> yeah, but by searching, it knows stuff about you. Doesn't oh no! It? I hope it doesn't. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, hopefully you do all those searches incognito mode. But certainly as an Echo um, competitor, one of the things that Google is very strong on is knowing stuff about you. And uh, whereas Echo can only have a certain limited uh, interest in terms of the things that it can do, it can't read your mail, it can't read your calendar, it doesn't know what you search for on the Internet. I think Amazon have got a search engine called A9.com, but nobody uses it. Um, However... You can't order a pack of nappies on Google Home, ah. which you can on Amazon, of course. Um, yeah, but come on, give it time. I mean, you know, Google are plugged into, well, the Internet. Um, in fact, in some respects, Google is the Internet. So uh, it, I'm sure it won't be long before they have some kind of integration with a Amazon-type service or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Look, I, I like the idea. Um, I just, I don't know. I think I think this this article is more more for you, isn't it? Well, and for the listener, uh, Google next announced the a new app called Allo, which is a kind of instant messenger chat with a few interesting features. You know, the ability to change the font size of the message was quite interesting, but crucially, Google Assistant can join in. So if we're having a little allo chat, uh, James, and I say, fancy going to, uh, you know, see, um, you know, Pink Floyd next Thursday, uh, the um, uh, Google Assistant might pick up on that and say, well, I can see there are tickets free for next Friday. Do you want me to book them? Mm -hmm. Uh, And kind of join in as a kind of... As a as a as a third person in the chat, a little bit creepy. Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, we're all aware that Google is listening to absolutely everything that you're doing, um, listening, sorry, is w- watching, monitoring, etc. The idea of it being physically there as a entity present in your conversation—that's going a bit too far. 
perhaps. Well, they also announced Duo, a one-to-one video calling service, which had a feature called Knock Knock, when when you make the call, instead of on the other person's phone, it just have have it coming up saying Robin is calling. It, might, it would have my video stream automatically streamed to you. So you could it could see me flicking these at you silently from your ring screen. That is definitely not what you would do i can't imagine that you would ever do something like that hasn't this got to be a vector for porn it it pro- it probably does and i wasn't thinking it but i now can't stop thinking it so <laughs> um yeah that's I, isn't this hangouts am i missing something haven't they just renamed hangouts now it's a very good point yeah it's it's sort of it's more like um apple facetime than hangouts i think in the way that it works and one of the things they said during the keynote was that the they went to the WebRTC team for Duo, uh, which and WebRTC is a kind of a standards-based video conferencing, audio uh, and video um, technology. Which is, um, but the advantage of it is it's very, very fast. Uh, it's built into the OS. It's, it requires very little um, CPU power to actually work. So really focusing on uh, efficiency and speed there whether they can pull it off i don't know they also announced daydream which is their vr platform yeah that's ah that seems a bit of me too doesn't it yeah i think they're a bit late to the party there but of course let's not forget that in 2014 google started the party with google cardboard mm. so they've got some chops think... in the cheap cheap vr sp- sp- uh, space well, did, did they start it well 2014 hey, were they the? Okay, well, I mean, we all saw VR before then, but okay, well. Oh yeah, well, VR has been around since the nineties, but they started this current revolution, I think, with uh, with that possibly. Anyway, who knows? Uh, there's some Chrome OS news which I'm going to come to a little bit later because it's so exciting, and I'm going to try and move a bit faster. There were some announcements to do with Android Wear two, yada yada. There was something called Instant Apps. This one's a little bit creepy. Uh, the example they gave, I think, was of um, booking uh, on booking something on Open Table, uh, and uh, what it would do is stream down just the components, the modules of the Open Table Android app, which were required to make a booking, um, and use that and then discard it. So Instant Apps is about downloading tiny bits of code as required to perform a function, either in search uh, or by the Google Assistant. I have to say the fact that they're modeling out on the accelerated um, mobile pages concept, uh, which for our listener is um, a way of optimizing web pages on mobile phones to make them appear as if they're instantly loaded and whatever. I think that's a good idea. Why they can't just use that technology anyway and just package it in some kind of app? Well, maybe they are. I don't know. Um, Because obviously a lot of these apps require an internet connection. Therefore, why can't you just sandbox them in a browser? Um, Very true. uh, Talking of things which don't make a whole lot of sense, Google Tango had some demos running where they had a were showing looking through the uh, through through a tablet screen into a virtual space. It kind of the Tango component allows it to create a three D model of what's in front of the tablet and then allow you to interact with characters in that. So there's a bit of gaming and a bit of fun. I've I think like you, I don't really see the point of Tango uh, for consumers. Uh, I, I, the um, article that we're reading here from Tech Radar sort of compares it to the way that um, Hololens works in that it's got a 3D detector on the front of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, also announced were there was a big segment on artificial intelligence and. Um, which was very interesting, but I'm not going to bore you with it. The most interesting stuff was to do with Chrome OS, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Is that quick enough for you? Because I know you don't really like a lot of Google news, but you can't avoid it this week. No, well, I, I think I think we got through all of the good, the good chunks. And if I may, yes. Do you mind if we take a minor segue into something else and then come back to our okay our Chrome discussion? Um, In the rival of Google, Apple, of course, uh, Mashable have reported that Xiaomi, and if you remember, Xiaomi are the uh, kind of iPhone clone manufacturer from China that try to... Is copy the right word? Well, let me put it this way. Their CEO wears a black polo neck jumper like Steve Jobs used to. 
yeah. and says one more thing at the end of his uh, presentation. It's a little... It's a, <laughs> they're not doing a good job of hiding that one. Well, anyway, Xiaomi have unveiled a TV streaming box with 4K HDR video. It runs Android. It's got a pretty decent spec with 2 gig of RAM and you know a, a quite quite a modern CPU. I mean, and that that's all fine. It looks exactly like an Apple TV. What is so good about HDR and what is it? Um, you know, I know what it is for when you're capturing images in a camera. Basically, you take lots of images at the same time of different kind of light levels and you blend them together. Um, because at the end, the human eye sees light at all different kinds of levels. But an old school camera, you adjust the light and therefore you might miss shadows or, you know, etc. There's a couple of examples on the web of HDR versus non-HDR images. So what does it do? It dials up the dark bits of the image and dials down the bright bits yeah, in real Yeah, effectively, it recreates what your eye sees. So I'll just give you an example. I was in Singapore a couple of years ago when HDR first came out on the iPhone. And I took a picture in the sun of some trees and the non-HDR couldn't tell the difference between the leaves. They all kind of blended into one. But the HDR version was able to see through the leaves to the sky behind them. It wasn't completely covered. And that was just the main difference that I saw. Because obviously the light level massively changes whether you're underneath the leaf or not underneath the leaf. And that was a really good example of that. Well, I have an Android TV streaming box myself. It's the Nexus Player, which is the reference platform made by Google themselves. And I love it. In fact, I've got two of them. I think they're really good. They're really fast. They've got plenty of power. Uh, they're not in stick form. They're in sort of hockey puck form, a bit like this Xiaomi box. Uh, it's sort of square, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's square. I mean, the difference is, and they will argue that they've not copied Apple because um, theirs has kind of smooth all over, whereas Apple's is, I guess it's quite it's flat on top and the Xiaomi is not. I mean, it, hey, look, it's a clone. They can't get away from it. I think what's... No, that's true. Well, interestingly enough, the guy, uh, the president of Xiaomi, or oh, sorry, Xiaomi's vice president of international is Hugo Barra, who used to be, uh, used to work for Google. So he's an ex Googler. Mm. Uh, and I think he's unashamedly establishing that connection back with Google for software, uh, with the Xiaomi hardware specifically to compete against, um, uh, you know, uh, Apple's offering because, uh, the, the the problem with Android TV boxes isn't their functionality because the functionality is great. Um, it's manufacturers. They can't find anybody to make them. That's why they have to make the Nexus range of devices because they can't find people to actually make them. So actually seeing this is quite interesting. Do you think that means that Android TV has got a little bit more life left in it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. What this, um, uh, If a company is going to do it, it's going to be one of the big boys. And Xiaomi, even though we're not f too familiar with them in the West... Uh, they're, they're, they're like, aren't they the biggest Chinese manufacturer? Of, you know, there's some huge like uh, manufacturer. I think they're like the number three cell phone uh, manufacturer in the world. So based on their Chinese sales alone, they, you can't even buy them in Europe or the US. But what's really interesting though about the this particular Xiaomi product is it's coming to the US. Yes, that's interesting. That is that is really that's really incredible. I mean, the the Xiaomi brand, I imagine will start to make its way and it will be, you know, as synonymous with devices as Samsung, I predict, in a, in a couple of years' time because, you know, now, of course, they announced this product at an American developer conference. So, it, you know, it, it would have been foolish for them to have just announced a Chinese product. They probably wouldn't have announced it at all, I would say, at Google I.O. Um, but it certainly it's very significant that they've announced partnerships um well, sorry, the, the big partnership with Google and the article highlights, of course, things like YouTube and Netflix, which are, of course, Western uh, services for, for streaming video. And the fact they've got the 4K as well, uh, does, does your Google Play box? No, in no way does it do 4K. Mm, yeah, well, that's great. I mean, you know, because the Apple one doesn't even come, I don't, you know, it doesn't even try, I don't think. But Apple are always a little bit behind in that kind of stuff, though. Well, I mean, I think that's the Apple model is to look at what the market's doing. And once the market is shaken out a little bit, come in late with something that, quotes works. 
so I don't think they've ever been they're, they're mistaken I think in the market for innovators but I think they're just fast followers yes yeah of course I mean you know Microsoft did tablets 10 years before the uh, well, maybe not 10 but certainly eight nine True. years before the iPad so well, I suppose the innovation is in making it stick and making it work. And I, and I think that, you know, a lo- Microsoft did most things five years before everybody else. It doesn't, doesn't mean they made a success of it. So yeah. success is a combination of um, functionality and non-functional things like design or speed um, or battery life. Uh, so I guess there's, you two, know, all in- there's two tech tasms here, if I may. You know, a double, a double tech tasm. Yeah, um, I guess the first is is Android TV a real thing? You know, is it is it going to actually hit, hit the mainstream? Um, well, I can't really call that one. It's in it, at the moment. It's in a few set top boxes like the Xiaomi yeah. to come and the Nexus Player before, and it's also in Philips and Sony TVs soon to be. Uh, other ranges of TV. So TV manufacturers are adopting it. There are some problems with that, uh, not least the performance of the chips inside. But the latest Sony TVs, for example, have got, uh, use the NVIDIA X1 chip uh, to power the Android TV component, which makes it really fast. But I think, think the 2015 model Sony TVs, flat panel TVs, could take 30 seconds to boot up. So when you turn them on, you have to wait 30 seconds before you can even watch TV, let alone use any of the smart TV. So, so I would say that's on, I can't really call that one one way or the other. Okay, but then the, so the second one is, I mean, is Xiaomi a realistic prospect for a Western device manufacturer? Well, I think if Huawei can do it, Xiaomi should be able to do it. Uh, Xiaomi's position in the market is on, you know, style, design, cachet, lifestyle. Uh, Huawei is on cheap and both of them seem to be doing very well thank you very much in international markets especially in comparison to the Korean manufacturers HTC and Samsung uh, and um, certainly you know within within the market they they are certainly within the Chinese market they're doing very well thank you very much I mean right up at the top really in the Chinese market so they've got that heritage uh, they've got the market testing, which they can do within China, within the product. So I think Xiaomi is very much a real. They're here to stay. Okay, let's move on. Chrome OS is coming to, uh, sorry, Android Play Store is coming to Chrome OS. The Verge reported this week, well, it was actually part of the Google I.O., so we're coming back to it, that the Android Play Store will be coming to the latest version of Chrome OS, probably in September, though early versions for certain Chromebooks with touch screens are coming in June. Now, this opens up the possibility for Chromebooks being able to use Android apps like Skype, for example, which you could never really do before. You could do IM on Skype, you couldn't do voice. Uh, And in fact, the vast majority of apps on the Google Play Store will run on Chrome OS. Now, originally, they were going to do this using the Arc Android runtime uh, component, uh, but they've changed it completely. So what they're doing is they're running an entire Android virtual machine, uh, sorry, a native Android runtime environment for each app inside Chrome OS, which directly accesses the hardware. So apps like Snapchat and things that require video or games, they demonstrated games run absolutely fine, thank you very much, Mm. using this new subsystem, as I say, coming later this year. Now, James, this is going to open up things like the Microsoft Office suite of Android apps on Chrome OS. Is this going to propel Chrome OS to be a mainstream uh, desktop, laptop operating system? 100%. And this reminds me of iPhone 1 going to iPhone 2, the birth of the App Store. Except the difference here, Google already has an App Store with over a million apps. I mean, this is... Well, okay, I know that number is large, and I I imagine most of them are useless. But still, there's a lot of apps out there, and Chromebook users who... Is there a Chromebook user in this uh, podcast? I'm not saying... (laughs) Very much so. There's a Chromebook fanboy. And actually, on more Chromebook news, Verge also reported this week that Chromebooks outsold Macs for the first time in the U.S. Now, Apple's uh, U.S. Mac shipments were about 1.76 million Mm. in the latest quarter, and Dell, HP, and Lenovo sold nearly 2 million Chromebooks in the quarter one combined. Now, that's incredible. Now, most of that growth has been in U.S., the U.S. school system, where over 50%, or certainly more than half, um, which could be the same thing, um, (laughs) of... (laughs) 
of laptops maybe, maybe used both. in schools, and they call it K twelve. I think is, uh, is K-12. yeah. That's, I guess I think that's our equivalent of A levels. Interestingly enough, on that subject, I was reading an article just before we came on the air this evening about how Apple are trading in iPads in schools in Maine in exchange for laptops, MacBooks, because the iPads just weren't working out very well for them. So is this part of a trend? I mean, are we are we seeing some... Well, I don't know. It's uh... Well, I asked my 12-year-old son uh, whether he would prefer an iPad tablet for school or a laptop, and he said laptop because he creates a lot of content. He writes stuff. Mm. Uh, whereas, of course, I suppose if you're younger, maybe a tablet where you can point and drag may be, may be more interesting. I think it's horses for courses. Um, certainly, if you go to university, I don't think anybody's using a tablet for anything uh, it'll be a phone and a laptop yes. uh, so uh, you know th- this news doesn't surprise me but where is the chromebook platform going to go next now I think google themselves the- have claimed that chrome os isn't going away anytime soon but they have stated this desire to merge chrome os with android now i think this week's or last week's announcements what they say to me james is that Um, they're going to take the best of Android into Chrome OS and the best of Chrome OS into Android. And eventually the two will be indistinguishable and they'll become a single code set. So I think they're going to do it very subtly and quietly. One of the things that Chrome OS does very well is when there's an uh, uh, operating system update, you just get a little notification in the corner. And this is because it maintains two full system images um, when when you're running Chrome OS. So when if it needs to update one, it just updates it in the background and then completely rewrites the second image. And when you reboot, it just reboots into the second image and the first image is then updated to the same as the second image. Now, what this means is um, that they've taken this technology across to Android N, which means that when you've got an operating system update, it'll say reboot and you'll get the new os and you reboot and it just reboots instantly it doesn't go through a sort of process of updating android app one updating android app two it can take about 40 minutes to reboot it would still need to do that in the background i mean if you've you know a lot of those apps it updates as well uh it doesn't update it it just gets an entirely fresh image do you remember i was saying to you that the reason why you can't infect chrome os is because every time you reboot it, it reboots with a completely fresh image of the os yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that, it's it's really great. If these guys put touch screens on their laptops, they've got a Surface killer as well. I was I saw a friend's Surface book today, which is an amazing piece of kit. If this gets um, touch screen as well, multi touch. So I, I mean, hey, and they can borrow that from Android. They've done it before. Well, no, they have that already. That's the Chromebook Pixel, which is their reference design, has a touch book, their touch screen. There are about two or three of them which have got touch screens, and they're very good, but it's it's like anything. Because it isn't a touch-first OS, it feels a little bit clunky. It's certainly got pinch to zoom on maps and images, which is, can be useful occasionally. Yeah, but the whole detaching the screen thing, I think, I think that's just awesome. But still, look, I mean, getting back to the point... Do you know what this episode is lacking, James? Go on. An article from Mars Technica. Are you, are you sure? Well, hang on, wait, wait. I think I've got one. And this is, this is someone different, actually. This is Mark Walton. I don't think we've heard from Mark Walton before. No, he's a new one. And, um, and he's I reporting. feel like I know them all personally. <laughs> yes, yes. Good old Ron Amadio. Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm sure, <laughs> sure we'll have an article from him. Next week. Uh, so Mark is reporting, and this is part of a throwback segment. Listener, we're trying something new. Um, that Nokia is coming back. Microsoft have sold the Nokia brand and its feature phone business to Foxconn and HMD Global Oi. Now, it, Foxconn, I know that name. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Let's focus on Foxconn because we know, we know who they are, the manufacturers of pretty much everything Every gadget that, that you've got, the iPhone, iPhone, Nintendo products, laptops, you name it, you know the the, the lot. Uh, what's so? What's really interesting about this is this is not something that's going to affect um, us in the the UK US market. Uh, it's purely the feature phones, and for our listener, feature phones 
are what you'd think of as mobile phones in the 90s. You know, they made phone calls and text messages and maybe played one game if you were lucky. So Tetris. The, Tetris, Snake. Do you remember Snake on the 52 Man. tent? You know, I do. That's, that's, that's uh, many, many, many hours of fun. Um, so, what, so what's really interesting about this is feature phones are making a comeback. Now, Microsoft have said that the smartphone business won't be a priority this year. Um is this the beginning of Microsoft sort of moving away from the smartphone market? Possibly trying well, to make a bit of money from that ridiculous, was it, $9 billion purchase of Nokia or whatever it ended up being? Well, haven't Microsoft... Well, certainly the rumor is that Microsoft are ditching the Lumia brand as well and moving out of phones completely. I'm not sure that they've done that yet. Well, but they're still thinking of a Surface phone, aren't they, which we spoke about a few weeks Well, ago. correct, yes. Yeah. So the question is, is whether the Lumia brand, well, they know the Nokia brand is toxic when it comes to phones, which is why they've done this. They've just licensed it like the, the name Polaroid is licensed in the US. The question is, will they then take uh, a good brand like Surface, the Surface Book, and make a Surface phone? And that's what all the rumors are, is that actually Surface is a better brand. It represents higher quality and therefore higher premiums and higher margins uh, and, you know, looking to very much get into the business that Apple are in, in making the hardware and making the software and make it work beautifully together. Though I would argue that the Surface Book is not a great example of that because a lot of the reports from early machines uh, have uh, described the experience as glitchy at best. Yeah, Uh, well, I mean, it's a Gen 1 product and we know... Unfortunately, having been in the tech industry, uh, V1s of anything are never very good. No, um, that's true. And that goes across every, com- every company, you know, uh, every product, every year, you know, the V1 is always a, you know, let's wait for V2. Well, what's interesting is that when they sold it for 242 or $350 million, it includes 4,500 employees. Yeah, that's a lot of people. I mean, where, where, they, where the heck are they? Well, well, it does say in the next sentence, and it's Vietnam-based manufacturing facility. So I'm guessing a lot of them are over in Vietnam. Yeah, true. Manufacturing in their facility. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, is, there a, is there a tech-tasm here? Um, well, I mean, our feature phones are making a comeback. That's just crazy. No, they're rubbish. <laughs> there you go. Job okay, done. Okay, well, that's great. All right, I think we've got time for what's one one last one. Just Squeeze the last one in. I'm squeezing, I'm squeezing. Waterstones. The listener's getting great value this yes, week. Absolutely. Waterstones is getting rid of e-books and digital readers. My what? wife has a Kobo, which really? I think is the device you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. In fact, the, so the Kobo, a brand in its own right, still exists. It's not part of Waterstones. And Waterstones, oh, okay. on June the 13th, all Waterstones customers with a digital library will get transitioned over to Kobo. And Kobo, interestingly enough, um, sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't say this is from Engadget from Jamie Rigg. Sorry, Jamie. Well I'm done. Sure, I'm sure you're a listener. Um, Kobo a few years ago absorbed Sony's e-reader um, libraries and Blinkbox books. Which maybe that was part of Tesco. Um, Blinkbox books. Yes, Blinkbox was Tesco's yes. digital service. So uh, which... Kobo is effect is now being the kind of assimilator of all e readers that have since gone past their best. Which is really but but buried in this article, and although this is great for people who've already bought their books, etc., if you're an audiobook listener, mid June you'll lose all your audiobooks. Unless you oh. download them on your PC, MP3s. That, do you know, I've often thought it was, somebody should do a good audiobook service to rival, uh, what's the big one that own, that's owned Audible. by Amazon? Audible. Audible. Yeah. I've often thought, you know, I would get into listening to audiobooks if there was a decent way to get them without having to pay so much for so little. I mean, how much does it cost, James? Do you use that service? Um, I've bought one or two. Um, I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not cheap. You know, you're looking 15, 20 quid. They're, they're more expensive than the book itself if you were to buy it in, in, in the shop. Um, Audible, I think, is owned by Amazon. Yes, I'm, yes, it is. So yeah. I'm a bit surprised. But I think the, the key to the story is um, Waterstones, a bricks and mortar physical book seller, is sticking to that format. I mean, that 
that I never thought the way forward would be going back. No, that, well, it's sometimes you've got to go back to the future. Yeah, this is well, this is true. But I, I was listening to um, a podcast, um, not this one, a different podcast, because there are others. No, there aren't. Um, okay, there are no others. There are others, but they're all rubbish. I was listening to another podcast and um, listening to the CEO of Waterstones talking about how the business was doing really well lately. And mm-hmm. in fact, ebooks for the first time are down in sales, which is, which is absolutely crazy. And print books is rising. What is going on in the world? I think it's, it's like the rise of vinyl again. Ah, yeah. uh, it's people like retro. It's that kind of hipster thing going on. Does that mean it's so, a fad? Well, think about Waterstones. What is the Waterstones experience? You walk in, it's got yeah. books. It's kind of muted and muffled. You sit in a sofa, you read a book, it you have a coffee. Pleasant, actually. Well, correct. Yeah, so it's actually about the experience you're buying. You think, well, look, I'll tip them, you know, 20 quid on a couple of books and uh, meander around enjoying it. So I think actually by... By focusing on the experience of physical books, which a lot of people like. My wife's actually gone back to physical books again now. Mm. She gets them from the library or she she gets a deal or whatever. She does it, you know, as best she can, but she's gone back to physical books away from ebooks. So I think actually, you know, there's novelty value in these electronic things. Uh, but some of them don't always stick. But let's hope, James, that podcasting is here to stay. Of course it is. Of course it is. And we are the first and last word listener in podcasting. Well, we certainly are, and uh, thanks for that Waterstone story. That is it. One more week in the can. You can find us at facebook.com slash techtasm. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Feedburner, or wherever. And contact us at feedback at techtasm.com. And remember, give us stars. Give us love. We don't want money. We want love. Now, we record every Tuesday at 2100 BST GMT, which is why we're recording on Monday this week. So watch out for next week's episode. Who the hell knows when it's going to be? This, dear listener, is me, Sir Robin Yellow. And me, Mr. James Woodall. Asking the question, is it real? Or was it just a load of old tech-tasm?